I have to start off by saying a couple of things. And I want to take a little poll from all of you. I want to know something. And thank you. Give me that light. How many of you had a civics class when you were in school? Just show of hands. Interesting. I would guess that everybody who raised their hand is over 40. Don't say it out loud. <laughs> Okay, I had one too, so we know that I'm over 40. I'm not gonna lie by my age tonight. But I think that this is important. And the reason why I asked you that is because civic seems to be an archaic word in our society. And when Kathleen and I talked about this, I was sort of struck by this because I'm like, I spent a lot of time talking and writing about evangelicals. And I thought, huh, how am I gonna talk about this tonight? How do I think? about this in the particular state we're in, in 2023, going into a presidential election, because that is important. Civics is important. Civic life is important. And as I talk to my students about this, um, I'm teaching a class now called God and Money, so you know, there you go, right? <laughs> but um, I showed them a series of things a couple of weeks ago about civic engagement and how in the 1950s, a lot of cartoons and um, public service announcements and everything were about civic engagement. And they're just looking at the screen blank like, oh, they did this? And I'm like, yes, do you even understand what civics is? And they really kind of did, but they didn't. And so I thought about this and I thought, something is missing. Something is missing in our understanding about what civic life is in America right now. And I'm not going to say that's for all communities, but I do think that Latter-day Saints have something to say to evangelicals about it. So I wanted to start off here because this is an important picture. This is from, of course, what you know as 2021, this historic meeting between the NAACP and the Mormon Church. $3 million was donated to fund scholarships for black students during the United Negro College Fund. $250,000 was given as a fellowship for students from the United States to travel to Ghana. And this was done by the President Russell M. Nelson. Now, $6 million also was given for three years of humanitarian aid to help underprivileged people in six metro areas of the country. The, this church announced initiatives ahead of Juneteenth, which is now a national holiday. I'm from Texas. I'm just still shocked about Juneteenth being a national holiday. And if you're from Texas, you understand why, because that is not something that we ever thought would leave the state of Texas. Okay? So while he did this, he prepared remarks about racial reconciliation and racial injustice. And so I wanted to start here because this is important. This is a marriage of people in the NAACP. We're talking about um, people, and on this side is Reverend C. Amos Brown, and then, of course, President Nelson. And then on the, on the right over to you is um, Derek Johnson, who's the president and CEO of the NAACP. Why is this picture important? Because I submit we could not see the same kind of picture with evangelicals right now. And the reason why we can't see this kind of picture with evangelicals right now is because of racial tensions in this country and because of the way in which things have panned out since I would say 2020 and George Floyd, okay? And how things have changed. And so what I wanna talk about tonight is the attitudes and behaviors that evangelicals and Mormons hold towards civic life and engagement. And this is not gonna be comprehensive. I wanna put that out there first because I know about some things more than others. I've researched some things more than others. And on top of that, I think that it's a, it's a hard comparison to make. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I think the comparison is hard in part because we're talking about a denominational structure, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we're talking about evangelicalism, which is comprised of so many different kinds of denominations and peoples. And I would submit to you that some evangelicals are not really evangelicals anymore. They're probably Pentecostals, but they get lumped in. Um, Non-denominational churches get lumped in to, Pentecost to evangelicalism. It's very difficult to decide now what evangelicalism really is. And for some of us, including myself, I think about evangelicalism as a political moniker now in the American context, as opposed to a denominational kind of construct. And I think some of this talk is gonna help you understand that. Now, but I think there are some things we can talk about that make us understand what evangelicals, Mormons, and civic engagement is all about. 
And first, I want to talk about the historical relationship to the government. Real persecution, LDS, versus imagined persecution, evangelicals. Those of you who are LDS in here know the whole history, and I don't have to recount that history, of the Mormon church with the United States of America. How that has panned out, the kinds of persecution that happened to Mormons and what happened to them, in part because of whether that was polygamy or being outside of what the supposed constructs of Christianity were and are, people think about them as being outsiders, but there was real persecution that was experienced. I gave a talk at the Maxwell Institute a few years ago about the American Baptists and a whole series of illustrations that showed up in one of their magazines called Tidings that showed uh, Mormons in various kinds of states that was just as bad as the literature of African Americans during the 19th and 20th century, the kinds of literature that shows people in these kinds of slovenly ways. This is not something that evangelicals have experienced. However, Evangelicals, when I talk about imagined persecution, imagine themselves to be a persecuted minority. This is in part about political things that have happened, whether um, prayer has been taken out of schools, whether they were um, not able to be um, as racially proscriptive as they would have liked, and I'm thinking here about Bob Jones University and others. There are ways in which evangelicals have cast themselves as persecuted minority, okay? But the persecution of evangelicals has never been, and I want to make that clear, has never been what the LDS church has experienced. And so in that particular sense, we can't really compare them on terms of this part of civic engagement. Evangelicals focused on calamity, catastrophe, rather than everyday needs in terms of civic engagement and a narrative about the end times. Why do evangelicals do certain things that they do, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, about civic engagement? Part of it has to do with disaster or calamity. Um, I'm thinking about the ways in which here that evangelicals respond to um, natural disasters and events, and you're going to see a few of those things in a minute. Part of this is also about a narrative about the end times. What do they expect to do for civic engagement in terms of thinking about the end? And so what missions work might be, and I'll talk about that as well, what missions work might be for evangelicals is a little bit different than what it is for Latter-day Saints. Um, I submit that you both want the same things. You might want to bring people to the faith, but the way that evangelicals think about this in terms of their civic engagement is very different. Shifting ideals about economics from self-help to prosperity gospel. I think for a lot of evangelicals, this pulling yourself up by the bootstraps has shifted into an idea about prosperity gospel. And I think this has really messed up the way that evangelicals think about civic engagement. And here, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. What I mean by that is the idea that you should be involved in giving to others in civic engagement is predicated upon what you think people deserve. And so that's a very different idea than saying, we do this because Christ wants us to. Now, this is not all evangelicals, okay? What I am talking about is a way in which prosperity has distorted the way in which you think about civic engagement. If it's all about the money, if it's about how do we help people, then how long do we help people? And the reason why I say this is because uh, at par back in 2008, I was um, working with one of my friends, Benjamin Anastas, in Atlanta, who was working on an article about um, the crash in 2008 and black churches that had um, had a lot of foreclosures because of what had happened and people being having subprime loans. So one of the things that happened, of course, was that you had a lot of people who lost their homes and they were also, in this sense, um, looking for help from their churches. Now, the churches provided that help, but what ended up happening was this. You had to say, I will go and look for a job at X um, if you come back more than a certain number of times, and this is one particular church that I'm thinking about, Creflo Dollars. If you come back a certain number of times, you were not allowed to come back. This aid was not universal. It was predicated on how long, how much, and if you're not showing prosperity in a certain amount of time, then we are going to cut you off. And so I think that's part of civic engagement and the problems with it. 
Civic engagement is moral suasion. This is for evangelicals. This is a way to engage people to switch them over to theological and moral beliefs. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But I think what's important is that the civic engagement is not simply about being civically engaged because you weren't involved with the government. What it's about is about changing the government. That is a different thing altogether. That is coming from a completely different place. And so when you see evangelicals who are involved in um, pro-life movements or they are involved in certain other kinds of things right now politically, part of that civic engagement is not so much about making civics grow and everybody being happy together. It's about limiting the structures because of their moral beliefs. And so I like to think about this as um, a group that I've been watching lately, Moms for Liberty, that has been civically engaged. On the one hand, you might think, this is great. We got moms going to um, school board meetings. They're running for school board office and everything else. What is happening is something very different. They are limiting civic engagement for others by deciding what kids should read or what they shouldn't read, all of these different kinds of issues. And that's happening from a very different place than I think what would happen in LDS, okay? Civic engagement as involvement and belonging, and this is where I put this in vocations about Mormons. I think your civic engagement is a lot about belonging and being a part of the American project, okay, writ large. And what I mean by that is it's not just religiously inflected, but it is driven by the fact that you have been put as outsiders in some ways. Not anymore. I don't think that is the case at all. Not anymore. But I do think the history of civic engagement for LDS has been very different in terms of that because you have to think about how do we belong and how do we engage this broader public that writes itself in America as Protestant. And we used to have this term, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. But for LDS, you were not considered white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You were considered as other. And so one of the things, even when I show you the charts today, I'm frustrated with is because on the one hand, I want to poll Latter-day Saints straight up as a, as a group. But if I do that, I put you outside of where you need to be in American Christianity. And I don't want to do that. And so this is the tension that I have in reading what is happening in terms of thinking about this sociologically because it makes it very difficult to kind of see things. But I don't think that's impossible. Differences in understanding of religious freedom. Professor Flake alluded to this about religious freedom, which I think is very important. LDS ideas about religious freedom are very different than the way that evangelicals are expressing religious freedom right now. Religious freedom for evangelicals is about how do we make our religion free and maybe not think about the rest of them, okay? It is about exclusion. All right, religious freedom is for certain people, but not for others. For LDS, you know what it's like not to be free historically, to, to exercise your religious faith. And so civically, when you make decisions and when the church makes decisions, you're making decisions looking at a long range view instead of a short range view. And what I mean by that is you're looking at this long history of being excluded from religious freedom. And I think that's really important to, to put out there and say, this also influences civic engagement and how that works. And then finally, moral issues. This might be the part where evangelicals and LDS really intersect on moral issues about marriage and the family and sexuality and all of these issues. What I do think, however, is how you engage civically is very different from that. And so, I'm thinking back to when Proposition 8 happened in, um, in, in 2008, if I'm remembering it correctly, and how people got blamed for the vote that happened. But then recently what has just happened is you have this edict that says, listen, we have to respect the freedom of people who are same-sex married. Why is that? This is a difference than when evangelicals would think about this. It says, we, don't, you know, we think Oberfeld was wrong, period, end of story. But you're coming to it from different spaces. You're coming to it from a sense of what religious freedom means to you civically versus what it means to evangelicals civically. And I think that's a very big difference. And so I want to kind of explore that by looking at what evangelicals say about themselves and civic engagement. All right. 
Here's a picture of the National Association of Evangelicals book, which came out in 2001, For the Health of the Nation, an Evangelical Call to Civic Responsibility. And I think this is really important because what it does is it shows something very different. This is a nice pamphlet. You can sign up for it right now and look at it from the NAE. And it sort of lays this out. But the way it begins is with biblical issues. And so I want to just read this here, and then I want to talk a little bit about the pamphlet. In a world full of division and partisan politics, it can be difficult to know, how, know what to think and how to speak up. We believe the Bible speaks to the most challenging issues we face as a nation. For decades, evangelical Christians across this political spectrum have used for the health of the nation to apply gospel principles to complex issues as a resource for Christian discipleship. It is designed to encourage thoughtful evangelical engagement as we work together for the health of the nation. So let me talk about the premise here, and I think this is really important. For evangelicals and this National Association of Evangelicals, which starts off in the 1940s after World War II, they are thinking about what is a healthy nation. And so if we think about evangelical history at that particular moment, what are they fighting against? They are fighting against two things. One is the fact that America has come onto the scene as this major player in, in world affairs. That's number one. But they also see the encroachment of other things as being antithetical to what they think is America. And so their idea of civic engagement, first and foremost from the 1950s forward, is to fight against outside forces. And so one of those outside forces is communism. And so this becomes a very big part of Billy Graham's messaging for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. You also get this through a whole series of evangelicals during this time period. It's also a way to push back against civil rights. LDS are in a similar position, but you're a more quiet space during this time period. It's not a, a public space like this, although you are doing similar kinds of issues, but you're talking to politicians in order to get a piece of that civic space. But for evangelicals, this civic engagement has always been a bit combative. And the combativeness is about boundaries. And the boundaries are very important for evangelicals. So when we get to the 1960s and we see the civil rights movement coming to fair, we also see the way in which prayer is taken out of the schools. We see um, Jerry Falwell talking about ministers and marches, that ministers should not be doing all of this kind of thing. It's the kind of civic engagement that says, we want to stay away from all of this stuff that's engaging in the political activity. But that changes in the 1970s. And I don't have to go through all the history because most of you know a little bit of it about the religious right and everything else. But what I think is important is that evangelicals have always placed their civic engagement in biblical terms. And so for both groups, this is important to think about how they think about scripture in terms of what civics is supposed to be. How do you think about the world? How do you think about God's engagement with the world? Is that one way, or how do you behave another? And so when they say division in partisan politics, I kind of laugh when I read this, because it's now old language, because now for evangelicals, it's all about partisan politics. And that's unfortunate, because those partisan politics and the way in which they construct their civic engagement is as a negation of what civic engagement is and their idea of civic engagement being right over and against what the nation is. And so I think that's really important. Now, also what they say about this is they think it's really important. They talk about the spirit in which they do the civic engagement. And I'm gonna use their terminology. We engage with a gracious and winsome spirit. I think that's really interesting because basically we should not echo the rage and disrespect that typifies much of today's political debates. And I'm like, oh my God, this sounds like you know heaven, except it's not happening, right? Indeed, this is, let me go on. As the combative nature of the 21st century public discourse threatens meaningful efforts for the common good, the tone of our engagement will be as strategic as our involvement. Evangelicals of all political persuasions and backgrounds must demonstrate that differing opinions can be handled without demonization, misrepresenting, or shaming. Now, I hate to tell you, I think you all know this by now, this is not the case. <laughs> this is not the case anymore. So this NAE book has been sort of replaced by a different sort of set of behaviors and different kinds of ways in which civics is being thought about for evangelicals. Okay. 
Now I wanna get into what are the practicalities of all of this? Where, where does this go? How do we have to think about this? And I wanna use the terms welfare, care, and giving as a way to think about where these differences lie. And I think practicalities are what I mean by practice. How does each group differ in welfare giving, works of charity, et cetera? Now, this is where I'm gonna tell a story about myself. When I was in Salt Lake a few years ago, I got taken around to some of the relief work. And I have to tell you, I was stunned because I've been to a lot of places, but I had never seen the things that I saw that you could go into a grocery store without having money and go shop for groceries. You could go and get clothes. You could go and, you know, people were making quilts and everything else. I just, I still have my quilt, by the way. Um, I, it was stunning to me because all of this was very organized. And of course, I knew about the Relief Society being a historian, all of this. But what I, what I realized was that while everything is centralized, and LDS in terms of the civic engagement and how you do this, it is so decentralized in evangelicalism, it's hard to pinpoint the places that these things are. And so I think what we have to do is kind of look at this in terms of what individual churches are and what individual denominations are doing. I also think about this, the practicalities as how and where do civics and ethics intersect and collide, okay? And what I mean by that is what is the ethical imperative of what do you do for civic engagement? In other words, do you feed the poor? Do you help the helpless? And one of the things I'm frustrated about um, for the last few years has been basically GoFundMe. Because GoFundMe operates like a, a parachurch organization except it's not a church. It's the place where you go and you give money when people are sick or they need money for funerals and things like this. LDS have a mechanism for all of this. Many Christian churches do not have the mechanism, especially evangelical churches right now, and I'm thinking a lot about black evangelical churches that are on the lower economic scale, don't have the, me the, the method to do this anymore as much as they do. So this part of the civic engagement has to come from elsewhere, and so you hope that you get some kind of governmental help. But when the message has been don't take from the government because the government is evil, then you have a problem ethically you have the problem of thinking about, do I take this money from the government? Do I take this welfare? What does it make me look like? And if I do do it, will these people shun me? And that's a problem. I have here self-help for evangelicals versus self-reliance. You know, if you are LDS, what it means to be self-reliant. And you know exactly what that term means. When I say help, self-help about evangelicals, this gets back to the prosperity gospel and the ways in which people have constructed civic engagement. Now, this works in different communities and evangelicalism in a variety of ways. There are some evangelical churches that are very much set up to help people who are not part of that church. So if somebody came and said, I need food, I need shelter, I need this, there are places that can help them. Otherwise, and I'll tell the story of a friend who needed some help because they ran out of money, they were told by their church, well, how long have you been a member here? Can you get this help? And I think that that's the part where I am dismayed by evangelicals because sometimes it's about membership and belonging as opposed to just doing the civic engagement and helping. This is also embedded in the theology of evangelicalism but also missions work. Why do you do what you do? Go ye all into the world and preach the gospel, right? This is the, the classic sort of scripture for evangelicals out of the last chapter of Matthew. This is important, but why are you doing it? What does it mean? And, and how do you go into communities to do that civic engagement, but also philanthropic work? What is it at the end of it? And I will talk about that in a minute. I think it's really important. Because for evangelicals, they start to think about this in a different way. And so this healthcare description that I'm gonna give you is, is really important. And I think that what is very different about evangelicals and Mormons is where evangelicals see this locus of healthcare. Now, let me talk about this in terms of a story about uh, a Tennessee state senator, who uh, Mark Green is his name. This is what he said about sickness. He told the church group, sickness is one of the main avenues that brings people to religion. In the gospels, he said, every person who came to Christ, with Christ to Christ with a physical need, it was either hunger or disease. Now, that's true, that's not, that's not dissimilar. But what he's saying about this is that maybe we don't need to give people this much health care. 
See how that works in the civic, in the civic space? We don't need these people healthcare because if they need it, they'll come. this will make them come to Christ faster, which is kind of a weird way to think about you know, salvation and, and evangelicalism. Like if you just suffer just enough, you're gonna want Jesus and then maybe you'll come to Jesus and then we can help you. I mean, that's not quite what I think either one of these groups would think, right? At least theologically up front. But if, you know, in Green's thinking, he thought that the ACA was really a great injustice because it was helping people regain their health and it limited the Christian's church role and robbed sick individuals of the opportunity to come to a saving knowledge of who God is. Now, salvation equated with sickness, and by the government inserting itself, that would mean that people don't come to Christ? I'm not sure about that. So now he says people are gonna to look to the government instead of God. This is classic thinking for a lot of evangelicals right now. If you look to the government to provide things, you're not allowing God to intervene. And so I think that's a really important distinction about how these two groups think about civic engagement and what those civics and what the government is supposed to do in the midst of that. I think also what's really important about this is that this is a shift. 19th century, you would have faith homes, you would have evangelicals thinking about faith cures and all these things, they would be praying for people, but they would provide spaces for people to be. This is a 21st century kind of switch. And I think this is where I'm seeing evangelicalism becoming more of this political monitor, moniker than a religious one. And what is the basis of engagement, evangelism or charity? Are you doing the engagement, the civic engagement, because you want to evangelize people, or are you doing this because of charity? And this is an important question, and I think a lot of times for evangelicals, that question is really embedded in the ideas about um, evangelism and engaging people on that level for civic kinds of engagements and not engaging with certain kinds of groups because of that. Next slide. Now I'm gonna talk about something we all know, which is the coronavirus. This is a picture on the left here. I think you all know that man. He kind of looks like his dad, Franklin Graham. And this is the tent that were put up in um, Central Park in March of 2020 for COVID. Samaritan's Purse does a lot of work, both nationally and internationally, in terms of civic engagement and health. And I, I have lots of thoughts about Franklin Graham, but I'm gonna leave his political life out of this. I wanna talk about the giving part and this part of how he engaged in civic engagement. When Samaritan's Purse came and said, we will set up and we'll do all this, because if you recall, there were, you know, this was the beginning of all the people dying in New York from COVID, um, bodies being stacked up in refri refrigerated things, funerals not being able to be held because funeral homes were just back, back to back to back. They set this up as a way for people to come and stay while they had coronavirus and to provide health care. Now, in a way, this was the right thing to do. But unfortunately, what happened was, because of who Franklin Graham is and his politics, people did not come. They ended up taking this down two months later. And the reason why they took it down is because they said, well, we don't have enough. But there was a lot of outcry that said, oh, you don't, you don't like you know, LGBTQ people. You don't do this, you don't do that. We remember you about birtherism. People would not come. And so I thought this was a really interesting way to start to think about the political aspects of civic engagement and how that kept people away from Samaritan's Purse. That did, not help. that did not help what he was trying to do at all. And Samaritan's Purse goes everywhere. I mean, they are, when there's an earthquake, when there's something, they are sending out planes, they're doing their thing. They were there for Katrina, they were there for lots of things, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I think one of the things that really hurt them and what hurt him at this point was the memory of how evangelicals treated people when disasters happened. And so if we go back to thinking about Katrina, this was one of those ones where you know, Pat Robinson and others said it was because of you know, the kinds of things that happened in New Orleans, they didn't deserve the help. Um, people said all kinds of horrible things about them. This is why they didn't come. Now you don't hear this from LDS because now I'm about to show you something else that happened right around the same time. And I remember this because this was like, kind of amazing to me. And I didn't see this exact picture. I actually saw part of this when part of all this money, this food that came from, um, 
from LDS in Bucks County, PA. This got distributed in Bucks County, which is right next door to Philadelphia and to Philadelphia. And the way that this worked in this particular instance was that LDS not only partnered with Christian churches, they partnered with Muslims because we have a large Muslim population in Philadelphia. And so this was an interfaith kind of a thing. And so this says something to me about how Mormons think about civic engagement. This was a time when people were lining up for food during the pandemic. And this was something that was really surprising to me because I didn't even notice it and I just saw this big semi truck parked out in one of the churches and you know, M Muslims and Christians and LDS all working together to distribute this food, part of this large donation that had been made. And so at this moment, it wasn't so much about how are we gonna evangelize because guess what? You know, you've got people who are hungry. Let's give out the food. This is civic engagement, engaging your neighbor, engaging who, who's there and not quantifying this or having people remember all the bad things that happened. Now this is not to say that these things haven't been said in LDS churches. What I am saying is that when the help comes, it comes a very different way. It comes with no strings attached. Let me show this too. This is also right around the same time. This is LDS disaster relief in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Juliet, Tennessee in March of 2020. There was a huge um, tornado during this time period. This is really interesting to me because what, what I see is the comparison between evangelicals and LDS is that evangelicals and LDS do show up in certain kinds of ways for natural disasters and for these big giant events. There, there's a similar kind of thing that happens and I'm gonna show you uh, Southern Baptist in a minute. One of the things I think though that's different is that there is an expectation and evangelicals for there to be prayer, for there to be church services and everything else. LDS don't come in like that. You come in and you work. There's, no, there's not an expectation about this and I think that's really important also to point out about how you think about civic engagement. This is not about I'm gonna make people do this thing, I wanna show something else. Yes, here we go. This is um, disaster relief. This is a Southern Baptist convention. This is one of the biggest things that they do. I, I got to tell you, I'm a person who looks at photographs a lot and I read photographs. So I looked at a whole set of um, LDS um, relief help versus Southern Baptist. This is what I always see with Southern Baptist. There's lots of pictures of the people doing stuff. There's people praying, there's people working. And for LDS, it's just like, I just see you working like worker bees all the time, which I thought, thought is very interesting. Now, both of these groups are always doing this kind of work in communities, but where is that the locus of that coming from? What, what do you do with how you engage civically? How do you engage someone who is out in a community that may not be like you, but you come in? The Southern Baptist way, of course, is to think about how are we going to have some conversions? Because that's what Baptists do. That is a theological belief. That is how they think about themselves. That is how they think about the work that they do. For LDS, that may be part of it, but what it is first is this imperative that is placed upon you as a person of the faith to do this kind of charity in a certain kind of way. And so I think that's important. There's also another piece of this that I think is, is really big where there's an overlap. And I wanna talk about that from the same time period. Notice I'm leaning a lot on coronavirus because I think it tells us something. Evangelicals and mask mandates. This was something that could prove civic engagement left, right, and center. During the pandemic, you had a tremendous amount of evangelicals who did not want mask mandates. And these are two pictures from um, protest, my body, not mask, my choice. And then, you know, this is really interesting because if you thought about this in an abortion kind of way, this is not what you would say differently. And then um, you have, we reject this, um, reject this thing about um, virus and, and the viral thing. This is where this became very interesting to me. Because on the one hand, many evangelicals did not want to take the um, vaccine, nor did they want to mask. And this is something that got spoken about a lot in the press about civic engagement. 
um, the ideas, and I didn't want to really get into this because we could go for a long time to talk about this tonight, about civic engagement and how evangelicals during the pandemic used this as a way to talk about their religious freedom. In other words, you need to respect my religious freedom to worship during this time period. So we are not going online, we are going to meet, and this is where you got a series of pastors who were arrested. But all of their claims were about religious freedom. But it was about religious freedom that wasn't thinking about the group of people who might be sick in their congregation. It was about, we want to exercise our religious freedom because it's our individual right. And so the individual in evangelicalism is important. It, you, I cannot stress this far enough, is that this is probably the biggest difference in the civic engagement, is that even though evangelicals may belong to the church, this individual idea about conscience is very different than how LDS is thinking about themselves and how you are behaving in civic spaces, okay? And so this whole thing about masks, um, about how we should be in church, this became a big thing. But Here's where I see the overbleed. Mass ma mandates in the L debates in the LDS church, right? So many of you might know this picture. This is from October 3rd, 2020. This was the members of the first presidency and quorum of the 12 wearing their face mask and distancing at general conference, okay? For a lot of people, that was a shocking picture because they didn't know what to do about it. Um, one of the apostles said that wearing a face covering during the pandemic is a sign of Christ-like love. Oh, people did not like that. <laughs> Clearly, Jesus would not wear a mask. <laughs> but I want to point out this, um, the, the comments over here, and this is from By Common Consent, who is a friend of mine, actually. I, we, we follow each other on Twitter for years. And I pulled this because I thought, from his blog because I thought, this is great. All right, And so I want to read a couple of these. Um, you know, to do this. It is uh, unchristlike to discriminate against people that cannot mask. It is unchristlike to discriminate and not allow people who have medical or mental exemptions who cannot mask, discriminating against them from meetings and temples. Then the next person, with all due respect, it's no longer about protecting others. Our God-given rights are being stripped away because of this pandemic. Aren't church members supposed to be defending their right to freedom of religion? <sighs> We haven't gone to church, I'm sorry, I had to do that. We haven't gone to church since March, but we can still fly on airplanes. That shows it's not about protecting others, it's about the government wanting to control us. I would tell you that I would have thought if you didn't tell me that that wasn't evangelical. That was not an LDS person. And so this is where I think this becomes interesting for me because it is the intersection of how the political is bleeding into sort of the kinds of ways in which people are phrasing themselves about what they think is right or, or not, you know. Uh, just wait, do you wear your mask every day will be the first question asked during your recommended interview. Do you support any groups or organizations that are contrary to the church will be thrown out. But hey, women can now get abortions as long as they wear a mask to show their Christ-like love. I, so this was, this was a moment, and, and, and this was a moment in almost every religious organization where you could see the pressure of something that was being mandated as something that was your civic duty and had a lot to do with government this was different than saying everybody buy a war bond. It didn't come out that way this, because everything was polarized at this moment. Everything was changed. And so even mass became this kind of polarized sense. And so I think what I want to say is that there has been a shift in how LDS and evangelicals think, and in part because of the political um, ways in which evangelicalism has bled into LDS and how this way you vote and the way you think and who is in charge, and at this particular time, that was a lot to do with Republicans, to think about how you think about civic engagement. Okay, now, let's talk about this. And political participation, voting, and political neutrality. And this is where, this is my home. So I, I really love the statement because this made me just made me think fantastic. Okay, so this letter that came out for the first presidency in June 2023 about Latter-day participation in electric and civic affairs reaffirms political neutrality. Now, I wondered at the time, why is this letter coming out right now? And I think this is about, personally for me, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, I think this is about what is coming in 2024. 
because 2024 is gonna be a, a very important time. So part of the letter says this, merely voting a straight ticket or voting based on tradition without careful study of the candidates and their positions on important issues is a threat to democracy and inconsistent with revealed standards. I keyed into that word revealed, just it, that really just jumped out at me because revelation is something that I've always been interested in and how that operates in the church. And so I put part of Doctrines and Covenants here, which was quoted there. Uh, Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Therefore, honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently. And good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold. Otherwise, whatsoever is less than these cometh of evil. And I give unto you a commandment that ye shall forsake all evil and cleave unto all good, that ye shall live by every word which proceeded out of the mouth of God. Now, this is very interesting to me. Oh, sorry, that means I got five minutes left. All right, sorry about that. I try to time myself so that I don't make everybody crazy. All right, so part, I know it's like bing. Um, part of this is really important because this is, a, this is not what is happening in evangelicalism. I, you know, and I will show you a couple of charts here in a minute, but we're gonna talk about Mormons and political affiliation first. Now, Mormons and evangelicals tend to vote Republican. But how you're going about that is very different. If, we, if I am to understand what is happening here. We want, people to, we want people to look at this and to think about what does tradition say, how you study this or whatever. Here's evangelicals. We're gonna have uh, every month from Charlie Kirk's Turning Point Churches USA meetings in Arizona before the 2022 election. Every month we're having a revival meeting. And every month, we're bringing in a Republican candidate so that you know who to vote for. They are telling you exactly who to vote for. This is evangelicalism. And this didn't start just with 2022 or 2020 or 2016. This started with Christian coalition in the late 1980s and the 90s, when you would actually hand out a political handbook. And I need to go back and look at this, and I didn't think about it for the talk. I would like to see if this made its way into LDS stakes during this time period. Because for evangelicals, you could just take the Christian Coalition's cheat sheet and bring it into the voting booth with you and go down the list and vote for whoever they told you to vote for. You weren't even allowed to think about it. You just got told who to vote for. And so for evangelicals, this would be like, are you kidding? Of course I'm going to vote a straight ticket. I'm not going to think about it. I'm, I, if I'm with the rest of my church, my rest of my church, we just had a meeting. We just had this, you know, Sunday, Freedom Sunday, or however they call it, I forgot, that, um, you know, you get up and you talk about the, the duties to vote and to vote in the right fashion, and the right fashion is to usually vote for Republicans. All right. Mormon political affiliation broken down by decade of birth. I wanted to show this in light of that statement because I think this is really important. And this is uh, from Ryan Burge, and this was in the Washington Post this year. Um, and you can see the breakout. And I want to get to the 80s and the 90s where I think that's interesting. Um, in the 80s, 34% of Mormons voted Democrat, which is really interesting. 12% independent, 54% Republican. 1990s, 33% Democrat, 20% independent, 47% Republican. I would love to see where this is right now because I think those, th that, that has moved somewhat and we're talking about if we're talking, you know, this is the end of people probably voting. I would want to pull this into 2000 just to see where younger people are voting right now and how they are voting if they're LDS. But I think that says something really interesting that you have gone down tremendously in voting Republican, which I think is really fascinating. And so something is happening, but at the same time, you are voting with you know, evangelicals most of the time. So I just put that out there to sort of think about what might be happening there. Let me go to this and talk about evangelicals for a minute. Because for me, this is the place where this is the problem for evangelicals. And this comes up with Trump. And let me talk about this in a, in a very brief history, and I'm gonna try to take five more minutes to do this. One of the things that's really important is that we could see in the 1980s and the 90s that morality and sexual indiscretion was a big part of evangelicals voting for Republicans. So when you had things that happened in the 90s, obviously, of course, with Bill Clinton in the 80s with other Democratic candidates, they were really not wanting to vote for people who were, let's well, say, morally whatever, right? Now, look at the change from 2011 to 2016, okay? 
on the scale, because I think this is really important. Pe percent who say an elected official who commits an immoral act in their personal life can still behave ethically and fulfill their duties in the public and professional life. This has gone up astronomically for white evangelicals in every, in every level. And I think this is really telling. And I, I'm going to tell a story on my state right now. Um, what's been very interesting is that we just had the lieutenant governor who was up, um, the, excuse me, the attorney general, who was up on several charges, uh, 16 counts, I believe it was, um, that he was supposed to be impeached for. He sailed through and was not impeached. Part of that had to do with him having an affair and lying to his wife about it and asking his aide to lie as well. And that really kind of tore apart the, um, the state in terms of the Senate. And this is still ramifications that we're dealing with in Texas. But somebody who said they were Christian, evangelical, of course. But this has not changed the voting at all. As a matter of fact, he's probably going to make it in again, which I think is really interesting. Here, I also think this is a difference. There is a way in which this used to be dealt with with evangelicals, but that train has left come 2016, definitely. All right. And last thing, um, this is a bigger chart. And I want to just talk about this for a minute because I think I would love to know, and this is, this is me asking this question about civics, if I could break out this. And I'm going to assume, this is not me, but I'm going to assume that when we say Protestant, white, not evangelical, that probably has Mormons in it, OK? Because they don't know where to put you. And they don't know how to, how to measure that. So if we think about this, Partisan ideas about morality of abortion, white, not evangelical, morally wrong, in most cases, 38%, morally acceptable. Abortion is not a moral, moral issue, no, no, I don't believe that. But let's go over to this other one, where most white evangelicals say that society is better off if people prioritize marriage and childbearing. I suspect that this number that is 64 for white, non-evangelical, that says, but just as well if people have priorities other than marriage and children, that isn't you all. And I'm wondering about where, how we measure civic engagement and morality against evangelicals and LDS. Because on some level, I think they're the same thing. But on other levels, I think they're really not. And I think that has a lot to do with theology. I think it also has to do a lot with the truth that people tell you on polling, which you know sometimes we all know can be skewed. Now, let me just end here and say a couple of things about all of this, OK? What am I saying in, in terms of this? One thing I'm saying is that I think that evangelicals have lost their way. If I could have done this talk a lot longer and had you know, two hours with you instead of the 45 minutes and the going over that I've already done, um, what I would say is that for evangelicals, civic engagement is a crisis right now. And it's a crisis because civic engagement is propelled by political activity. And so where the locus of political activity comes and civic engagement comes for evangelicals is based not so much on evangelical belief as it is based on what their particular choice of political party believes. And for the most part, that is Republican. Okay. And so how they engage in the civic arena, how they talk about race, how they talk about gender, how they talk about all these things that engage civic life as well as religious freedom have to do with individual beliefs that sometimes dovetail with corporate beliefs, let's say in, you know, in, in a group like the Southern Baptist Convention, but for the most part are about people's desire and non-understanding of their own theology. Okay? So in other words, what I'm saying to you is that civic engagement for evangelicals does not flow out of their theology anymore. It flows out of other things. And I think that is something that really needs to be addressed and studied in more detail. Because I think if we start to put this up, up against certain scriptures, um, it would be as though this pastor who said this a little while ago is like, it seems like people don't like to hear the sayings of Jesus anymore. And I don't understand why. It was because they told him that Jesus was not tough enough. I'm not kidding. And that's really sad. I think for LDS that civic engagement plays a very big role in how you think about yourself and the public persona of the church. What I do fear is that the pull towards the political 
will make you lose some of the things that you've had, that you've had to build up within the church because of your outsiderness. And I don't mean that to pejoratively say that you are outsiders. What I mean by that is to say that your history speaks something to you about civic engagement because you've had to be civically engaged within your own communities in order to survive. And that's a very different thing than what most evangelicals have had to do, which they are thinking about civic engagement in terms of trying to change the broader society. Both groups may want to change the broader society, but what I believe that they really do want and how you get it is coming from very different spaces and very different ideas about civic engagement. So I hope this kind of engaged you and tried to make you think about a little bit about what you personally are doing civically, how you're engaging with the community, and how this might make you press me to ask some different questions about civic engagement. And I hope that I did justice to this wonderful lectureship. And if I had Joseph Smith to talk to here right now, I'm not sure what he would say to me, but I hope he would say that I had done a good job. <laughs>